Good morning, everybody. How are you? This is Tracy Polachek. I'm so happy to be here again with Elevate. Uh, Elevate is doing some awesome things for our community, one of which is providing free virtual trainings and webinars, which I've been just honored to be a part of. Um, as a professional in the community growing up here, this is one way that I feel like I can give back during this crisis. And I wanted to encourage you, if you haven't already, uh, web Elevate has all of these webinars on their Elevate page and they have a YouTube page with a link so you can see all of these. Um, this Silver Linings webinar along with the other ones I've done will be available also on my Facebook page, uh, Polichek Therapy and Consulting on Facebook, a link to that and it has my information as well. I'm so excited to be here today. I wanted to let you know that um, during this crisis, we've been focusing a lot on survival, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about what we can do. We can always do something, and crisis offers us amazing opportunities for action. And action is often the one thing that gets us out of those feelings of anxiety and despair. So today we're going to talk about what are some of the silver linings in this crisis that we're going through right now. We're going to um, uh, after this chat, I'm going to answer questions. So as you're thinking of them, as we're going through, put them in the chat. I'll close down my screen and I'll answer them. And I'd also like to challenge you a little bit too, to what are some of the silver linings that you're already seeing? What have you noticed that has come out of this that's been a blessing to you? Put those in the chat and I'll, I'll shout out those at the end. I'm very curious to see that. Um, today, what we're going to talk about is I would like to just talk about what happens in a crisis, how we can leverage crisis behavior to move forward and actually grow. And I'm going to give you a couple of exercises that I do when I go to businesses or I do individual therapy. Uh, right now, I'm like you. I am into week five of this crisis, being at home, working from home and homeschooling my three children. So I'm pretty much an expert at five weeks, right? No, but I, I have learned a few things. Um, and one of the things I'm doing from home, uh, these webinars, I'm consider, can, can, I continue to do consulting, but I also am seeing therapy clients via telehealth. And so having to juggle that and, and modify your whole work stream has been interesting. And it has been a bit of a crisis. There, there are things that we all expected to be doing right now that we're not doing. We've had vacations canceled. We've had our kids home. We, we, some of us have had businesses close and it is a huge crisis. We've lost our jobs. We are worried about the future. So I think the first thing I wanna say is I don't wanna minimize anybody's feelings. Though we're gonna talk positively today Whatever you're feeling is okay. I myself and talking to clients and myself personally am really, really processing grief. I am grieving the loss of what I thought I was gonna be doing. I'm grieving the loss of really just a sense of safety and security that, that I think we all have had and have lost in some way. And for me, I feel that grief and loss here I'm grieving the loss for others who I know have lost their jobs, for the poor who I work with, who are really, really struggling and wondering how long this will go. I'm, I'm also in the same space, balancing that with feeling incredibly blessed, incredibly, incredibly grateful that my children are here, that for now we are safe at home. And then I have that piece of uncertainty. How long will this go on? I think the difficulty with this crisis is that in other disasters that I've responded to in disaster work, it's been a tornado, it's been a blizzard, it's been um, hail damage, all of these things that happen and kind of move in, create a crisis and we move forward. And although there is damage that's lasting, the crisis itself is not continuing to occur. And that's where this under, that's where this uncertainty happens. So all of these things for me are existing in the same place. And although I'm going to talk about some positive things today, it's okay if you're not here yet. It's okay if you're not ready to look at these silver linings. And it's okay if you are ready today and you're not willing tomorrow. What we're going to talk about today are concepts and ideas that can be revisited anytime you are ready. And I hope you understand that 
you are doing amazing. I don't even know what you're doing, but if you're coping, if you're safe, if you're processing and you're putting one foot forward, you're doing great, okay? So I wanted to make sure I got that out there, my, my encouragement for the day here. Um, I would like to just talk a little bit about crisis to clarity. This is um, something that we, how do you view crisis? Everybody that I'm talking to that's on here has been through some type of crisis. Now, for some of us, it's a death of a family member, it's a divorce, it's a loss of a job, it's leaving a job, um, it's a loss of a relationship. Everybody has been through this. So it's, it's interesting to look at how you've made it through before. What did you notice? How, how do you look at this? When you, when you encounter crisis, do you look at the loss, you focus on the loss of the familiar. Do you, do you spend a lot of time grieving with and, and have difficulty moving on to the, to the future? Or do you look at this as life is changing? All I can do is respond in the way that I can respond. How do we do that? So I think that's important to say, how do I view crisis? Because if you tend to stay in the in the unfamiliar, if you if you tend to stay in the familiar and grab onto it and and not accept that this crisis is happening, there are things that we can do to change that. I think that this arrow that we see on the screen right now, there are really these two two ways forward. And for most of us, we we feel that anxiety and we retreat and we re resort to our coping mechanisms, which you know, for me is like eating goldfish crackers at all hours of the night and, 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 you know, fervent prayer at times, I don't know, and, and feeling that anxiety, but then we come back around. Two choices here. If you choose that anxiety and retreat, all that does is prolong your processing of the crisis. You're going to process this. For example, we're collectively going through this as a group. And what we see often after disasters is that first few weeks, few days is everybody mobilizing, everybody getting together. We've got that going on in our community right now around food, around housing, around basic needs. Then as the weeks stretch on, people are still in survival mode, but they're getting their safety net together. How am I living? Are my people together? What do I need for safety? Then it becomes your new normal. It's still your crisis routine. You're still thinking this is temporary. So you're still in a survival mode. You might not be emotionally processing this. I've talked to many clients who week one, week two, we're going okay, but our body will hit a wall and we'll say, I'm exhausted, I'm tired, I need to rest. I, I have, once you have your safety kind of short up is when your body says, all right, let's process some of this. So you might feel an increased amount of anxiety. You might feel an increased amount of sadness and crying and tearfulness. These are important steps in dealing with trauma. It's just your body saying you're processing this. Now it's what we do with that that really matters. Most of us will come out of that just fine. We'll get into some healthy coping. We'll figure it out. We get into a routine and we're okay. If you stay in this anxiety phase, if you are having pretty severe symptoms, meaning it's impacting your day to day and it's going on for longer than a week or two weeks, and it's impacting sleep and relationships and work, you may want to consider reaching out for some professional help. Like myself, a teletherapist that can meet with you and coach you through this. This is what we do. We are prepped for this. And for those of you who may not have ever had therapy before, let me just tell you, it is, there's no shame in this. We have come a long way with the stigma. It's no different than going to a physical therapist after an injury in order to heal. You go for a period of time, you do specific things to help you toward your goal and learn tricks and tips, and you come out the other side with, with a lot of skills to go forward. So that's how that works uh, in therapy. So what we're gonna talk about today is how we take this and leverage it and move toward growth and resilience in absolutely every crisis. If you think of life as a classroom, ready to teach you things, most of us will admit that it's in the hardest times, the times of crisis that we've actually grown and learned the most. And sometimes it took a crisis, I'm speaking from experience here, at a job, at a relationship to get us out of there on to greater things. So what I want you to do is think about how you can leverage this to move toward growth and resilience. We're gonna talk about how we shift from 
I can control what happens to how I can control how I react. We're going to talk about like, what will I learn from this crisis? There's an awesome meme going around a, a graphic saying, who do I want to be in, in during COVID-19? And I really, really emphasize this in my past webinars that your intentional choice to how you respond to this, how you lead your family, how you model to your family, how you model if you're a business owner, how you model as a friend, as a family member, is could be one of your greatest moments leading through a crisis. How you lead yourself, you are important, you know? You might not have kids, you might not be a boss, you might not be, but you can lead yourself through this and that's amazing. I also liked this quote I saw that said, you know, the reputation or, or the, the behavior that you display during this crisis will make up or complete the reputation that you enjoy for the next coming time. And I thought that was really great. Thinking about a silver lining of all this is if you can learn to show and be resilient, then you're going to reap the benefits of that. People want resilient leadership. They want resilient workers. They want resiliency in all of their relationships. So it's an amazing thing to think about. What is this crisis meant to teach me? What if life is a classroom, if I view things as lessons coming toward me that I can learn from, and if I accept that there will be discomfort in crisis, I want you to just say that with me, people. Let's just try to accept it. There will be discomfort in crisis. And when I say discomfort, I just want to say, dissuade you of the fact that it could be discomfort over here, or it could be really, really traumatic things. I mean, let's face it, we don't know this crisis that we're going through a global pandemic is something that we, I have not lived through in my lifetime. And it's something that we're uncertain about how long it will be. And it's something that I don't know for a fact how this will end. So I'm not gonna minimize the impact of that, but I am gonna maximize this, no matter what, whether it's discomfort or all the way to the other, other end of the spectrum, you have opportunities for growth and resilience and you have choices. So we're gonna talk about what that means. Um, what skills do I wanna take as I enter into the next phase of my life? What do I wanna have in my toolbox? If I look at this crisis as every time I work on my resilience, which we're going to go forward in that. That's going to give me tools to put in my toolbox that I can bust out at any time in my job, in my family, in my personal life to create a mean, meaningful and intentional life that I want to have. So be thinking about that as we're going through this. What can this crisis give me? What are these gifts that it's already given me? Put it in the chat. I want to hear what's going on with you and see how you are. Um, and just to reiterate that growth rarely, if ever, I think in my life has come from our comfort zone. When I'm comfortable, I don't, I don't really want to grow. I want to enjoy that comfort. You know, when I'm comfortable, it doesn't spur me on to think about things. What is the number one silver lining of this crisis for me so far in week five of being at home is that crisis like no other thing drills down to the most important things that you find in your life. What is it? What is it that you value most that you don't think about or that you might be taking for granted? And I know for me, it has been the busyness of life. It has been really being intentional about creating how I spend my time and how I give back. I've been saying yes to a lot of things. And when you say yes to something, you're, you are really saying no to other things. So crisis gives you clarity on what's important. And we're going to walk through a couple exercises to even help us kind of distill that down. Um, I want to move forward and talk about if we're, if we're going to sort of focus on growth and resilience, I want to talk a little bit about resilience. This is a buzzword that's out there all over the place. And I really love this. I love this. Um, I love this definition right here. Resilient people are able to utilize their skills and strengths to cope and recover from problems and challenges. Why do I love this definition? For a couple of reasons. One, this says everyone has skills and strengths. I believe that. I absolutely know that. 
you sitting out there right now have skills and strengths that I don't have based on your experiences in life, the things that you have gone through and the way that you've gotten through hard times. That's what breeds resilience. So this is what a gift that it's giving us is resilience. And everybody has been through crisis. So everybody has some degree of resilience. And here's the other cool thing about resilience, people. It can be learned. I don't have to just have this, right? I don't have to go through the most traumatic experiences to get resilience. I can learn how to be resilient. And that's what we're gonna focus on next. That brings us to this. Here's some factors of resilience. These are some of the things that resilient folks have in common. They hold positive views of themselves and their abilities. This is a tough one. Some of us really struggle with self-esteem. We struggle with feeling like we're okay, we're good. This can be learned, right? We can learn to look at our strengths. We can learn to reframe things that we're doing as strengths. They also have the capacity to make realistic plans and then stick to them. Keep moving, keep going, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, right? I think I talk about realistic plans a lot in therapy and a lot in corporate coaching, in corporate coaching and training. Sometimes people don't make success in a way that they have control over. For example, if my idea of success is that I, I will not catch this virus. Okay. You don't have a hundred percent control over that. Now you can do a lot of things to minimize that. So you can say, I'm going to do what I can to keep myself and my family safe. And then you get to define what that is. Now that is a definition of success that you can be successful every single day, right? So being mindful of how we're defining success is very, very important. Having an internal locus of control. Now this is a psychology word or term, locus of control. What this means is, do I view myself? Do I feel like I have control? Do I feel like life happens to me? Or do I feel like I go out and take responsibility and things that I do have an impact, right? Being a good communicator, this is something we can learn. We can learn this resilience factor. Communication is really important. In crisis right now, we're at home. If we wanna work on communication as one of our tenants for our committed action exercise, what an awesome goal to be a better communicator. That's gonna play out in every relationship in your life. And relationships are the keystone to meaning and purpose. So what a great goal to improve your, your communication skills. Viewing yourself as a fighter rather than a victim. Seeing things as I will fight, I have influence, I have power. Whatever starting small that is, we start small, we get bigger, I have power, I am not a victim. And if I have been a victim of something, to honor that and move forward to survivor is really important. Another and last important factor of resilience is having high emotional intelligence and managing those emotions effectively. What does that mean? It means I need to know how I feel and why. I don't even have to totally know what to do about it, but I need to have a good handle on what I'm feeling. Here's a tip for you guys. You know, like I do an emotional check-in with my kids. I do it with myself every day. How am I feeling? What's my check-in? Um, I thought it was adorable. Uh, my, my fourth grade daughter was doing a class Zoom meeting yesterday and the teacher does a weather check. And she says, what's your weather today? And they say, I'm sunny or I'm partly cloudy or I'm cloudy and it's really an emotional check-in. And the teacher has valuable information. Well, this person's kind of cloudy today. I might give them some grace, right? Um, and speaking of grace, I think that's one of the best silver linings of all of this is that uh, my, I was saying this in my last webinar, I'm just giving grace all over the place. You know, say it, give grace all over the place. We are so much more kinder and forgiving to each other during a crisis. And I'm really, really noticing that in so many ways. It's funny how we're all on Zoom, we're all navigating technology, we're all homeschooling, and people are being so forgiving and understanding about that. And I think that is one of the best silver linings, and I hope we carry that forward. So how do we use these traits? How do we, chances are you have these, you are doing these, you are an amazing, complex human being who has been through awesome stuff, and you're already doing a ton of this, but how do you leverage this during this crisis? Take stock. What 
have you been through in your life? What crisis have you been through and how did you get through it? What strengths did you take with you? Um, what did you learn and how, what would you do differently? This is an awesome time to learn from your own past history, what you did well and what you would like to do differently. That's how we can take these factors of resilience. Is there anything in this list you need to shore up or you want to work on? Um, these factors here can all be goals in the exercises we're going to do. Um, these can all be turned into action steps. Now, I want to talk a little bit about values versus goals, and I'll, you'll see why in a moment. Values often get mistaken for um, kind of things that we never live up to. I like this definition. Values are principles ethics, standards, and morals that guide your actions in your daily life. The having values brings meaning, self-worth, and purpose to your life. You want to think about values as, as a compass. If you're heading true north, this is where your values send you. They are not goals. They are not tasks. They are things that you hold dear that increase your self-worth and meaning and purpose in life. And why is that important? Because you want to find that wholeheartedly in this crisis. And most often the crisis will do the work for you because you're left with saying, if I left this earth today, what would I want? What would be important to me? What would I have want to have done to be, to have been remembered for? Crisis can do that for you, right? So that's what your values are. Now, goals are those milestones, projects, tasks that by working toward them, we express and live out our values. Now, how do we get derailed with goals? I'll tell you, like we're so goal oriented, right? We're look at this beautiful graphic with the journal on it. And we're going to we're going to have goal setting classes and we're going to we're going to get together and brainstorm and it's in our wheelhouse and, you know, all these things in business and goals are awesome. You have to have goals. But what so often happens is we focus more on the goal attainment than we do to connecting it to our larger values or our larger plan for success and meaning and purpose in our life. And crisis can absolutely help us do this. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about in, in doing this is we're going to talk about, first I mentioned it, accept, accepting the crisis to action a larger plan for crisis. And then we're going to drill down on these values. I'm going to give you a couple exercises to do this in your own life. So I talked a little bit about accepting the current situation. Now you may not be ready to do this. Remember, it's okay. Some days I've accepted this and some days I am very sad. And it, and the path back to normalcy or going through a crisis is never straightforward. You don't get here and then, oh, I went through that process and then I get to go here and here. It's not linear. It often looks like this. I did this. I did this. It was amazing. And then you know what? I took a few steps back. I did this and I took a few steps back. As long as we're moving forward, we're doing okay. Okay. So acceptance to action, define your values. We're going to define what your values are in some exercise in the next exercise. We're gonna set some goals as a result of those values, not the other way around. We're not gonna let our job, our busyness, our craziness, the Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, whatever commitments we have decide where we're gonna go with our life. We're gonna take charge of that. And this crisis is a perfect time to allow us to do that. We're gonna then specify really, really um, specific actions to achieve those goals. We're gonna also look at um, in this, I, we've identified some fears or avoidant behaviors that block your goal achievement. We are not going to drill down a ton on that today. We don't have time, but this is something you can do in therapy. You can do with a friend. You can do in your journal. What is it that I'm afraid of when I think about reaching these goals? Those are things that you can do. And then there's ways to work through them. If they're small, if they're manageable, you might be able to do some of that on your own, or you can work through them by reaching out to a coach like myself. This is what we do. We help people work through those things with solid plans to break through to them living meaningful lives that they would like to live, right? And then last, we're gonna take committed action. That's the thing. Action is the antidote to despair. 
we can always do something. It doesn't have to be this big grandiose thing. You don't have to reorganize your whole house and do Pinteresty stuff, but you can do something to make you feel like you're moving forward to the life you want to live. Okay, guys, so that what I want you to do next is you can do one of two things. You can actually do this as we're talking about it. And then if you wanted to share in the chat, maybe some uh, how it felt doing it or what surprised you, that would be great. Or maybe what, what surprised you about your values, that would be awesome. Or you can just take notes on this. And again, this webinar will be posted on Elevate's page. So you can come back to this exercise. It'll also be posted on my uh, Facebook page, Polichek Therapy and Consulting. But I'm going to walk you through this exercise next. And this is called the Valued Living Questionnaire. I use this a lot in therapy. This is not something I developed. This has come out of, uh, um, uh, um, I think it came out of the Anxiety and Phobia Workbook, which I love to work with. And it's based on Wilson and Scherer's work from 2002. And I, I modify it sometimes, but this is just a great exercise. Um, some things that I wanna mention about this. So if, I was in a coaching session or a therapy session and I was talking about how to use this. One of the things I challenge you to do is I think about the times that you have meetings scheduled. We have mammograms, we have all of these things. When's the last time you set up a meeting with yourself and said, I'm taking you out for coffee. I'm taking you to the independent ale house. I can't wait till they open back up. It's my favorite place and get the Bob's popper pizza. Come on, come on. But when, have you really thought about the self-care that you need to do to live an intentional life? Think about how we'll meet with our employees. How many times have I met with my employees and talked about their professional development and, hey, what can I help you with and how do we do this? When do I meet with myself to do that, right? Take yourself out once a month. Do this exercise, print this out, write it out, and see how you are keeping on track with living the life that you want to live, okay? And do this frequently and come up with committed actions. And I think what you're going to see is it's an act of self-love. It lowers our stress. It gives us a sense of action in times of crisis. And I think you will feel that this will increase meaning and purpose in your life because you're actually paying attention to making decisions based on values, okay? So let's walk through this. So this exercise is really easy. You see here on the screen, we have a life component over here, and then we have a rating system from zero to 10. Zero being not important at all, and 10 being extremely important. So if you would like, you can walk through this exercise as I'm explaining it and go ahead and do it. Jot it down on paper. Family is, is number one. Other than romantic relationships or parenting, it's family. So you might wanna talk about like, how much do you value extended family time, family time, family that it means to you. Um, it could be things like your relationship with um, siblings. You know, we often love to hang out with our siblings, but we get fractured. We're, maybe we're across the country. So family other than your spouse, your romantic relationship, or other than parenting, because those will be separate. The next one is your romantic relationships. Um, how much do you value these things in your life? How much when we're thinking about our trajectory and we're distilling down because of this crisis, what is important to me? If you were to say how important on a scale of one to 10 is family, where does that fall? Don't think too much about it. Just circle the number. It goes down to parenting. How important is being an intentional parent to you? How important is being a good parent? friends and social life, work, education and training. Now that means, do you have a love of learning? Is that important to you to feel like you are on top of your game in your life in areas of work or family or parenting? And is it important that you have education and training? Where does that fall on the scale? Recreation and fun. This is one of my favorites, obviously. Recreation and fun. Where does that fall in for you? Zero to 10 in your life right now in terms of a value. How much do you value that and want that in your intentional life? Going forward, we have spirituality and religion, citizenship and community life, and self-care. Self-care is a buzzword. What I think self-care should really mean is how you treat yourself, how you value 
keeping your stress levels low and your meaning and purpose high. That's really how I, how I define self-care. And some, some of you, I'm going to give you just a little bit of time and I'm going to explain a couple things for those of you that are going through this, continue to go through. I want to just make mention of something here that if, um, if we have things that aren't included on here, it doesn't mean they're not important. And in fact, when I'm working with an individual and I get to know them and I ask them what's important to them and what do they value in life, there's some really specific things that are not on here that you can always add. A couple of them that I wrote down were sobriety. Um, many of us are struggling during this time with remaining sober. And it's really difficult if our coping mechanisms are in-person sponsor meetings or AA, or even um, just being out and exercising and, and socializing. And so having to find new ways to cope has been really challenging for folks and it's not impossible. And that's another way you could reach out as well. But sobriety could be one on here that's really important to you because for that, it impacts everything on this list, correct? Another thing that impacts everything on this list is your mental health management. And that, while I would probably consider that to fall under self-care, some people really need to make that a separate value because they might be struggling with a chronic illness, struggling with a chronic uh, mood disorder or a trauma, and it really needs to be highlighted in here in order to be intentionally thought about and goals set at that point. So those are just some things to do. Okay, so for those of you in the chat that have done this, um, maybe make a comment and I will shout out at the end. Um, I'm going to move forward to the second part of this. So after you've done this whole thing and really thought, you know, went through the list, added anything you needed to do, assigned a number value to it, you want to do the second part of this exercise. And the second part of this exercise is called the committed action exercise. Now remember, we're moving from values to goals, right? Because we want our goals to help us live out our values in our daily life, right? So the committed action exercise here and thinking and framing this around the crisis that we're in. How might my values have changed from my last meeting with myself to now when I am in this crisis? They might have changed. Safety might be really important to me. My health might be really important to me. Um, my relationship might become way more important to me since I'm spending 24 seven with that person, correct? Um, okay, so let's go through the committed action exercise. So then, you wanna take the top three or four, and you can actually go through each one with this, but you wanna take your top three. You say that, and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna kinda of call you out on this. We lead busy lives. I go into seminars and, and I have people do this as a group and people will say, oh, family's a 10 for me, right? Cause it's a 10, it's a lot of times it's a 10. We love our family. But then I say, how much time are you spending in intentional quality time where you feel meaning and purpose in your family during the week, during the day, during the week? And people's faces just fall because the busyness of life, of work, of everything prevents us sometimes from really carving out that time, right? So this committed action exercise actually says, I say that my family is a 10, so let me carve out and reclaim this space in my life. And, and lo and behold, a lot of us now happen to have a lot of together time that we could reemphasize family and we're being forced to reemphasize family time. And so how can I make that meaningful and purposeful? So you want to name that, that component, a component of the life that I value is and name whatever you put on there. If you had tens or eights above, above six or seven, start with those. If it was family parenting, put that value in there. The next the step you wanna take is my intention for this component is what? What do I want to do differently in my parenting, for example? If it is that I wanna yell less, I know I do. I just did a peaceful and productive uh, webinar for Elevate where I was talking about how to reconnect with your kids while homeschooling and all this. And I bribed my 12 year old to watch my seven year old and I'd lock the door because this is like my makeshift office back in my bedroom now. And 
at three times during that webinar, my son was knocking on the door. Thankfully, I don't think anyone heard it. And so after I get off and I'm all love and light, I get off, I open the door and I'm like, James, you were supposed to watch him. You know, we yell, we make mistakes. So is it that I want to yell less? Is it that I want to spend more, more quality time? Whatever it is, you're going to put that intention in there. And then the committed actions that I'm willing to take are, you're going to go deep with that. These are the specific things that I'm going to do this week and this month to make my intention happen. And I'm going to give you an example of something I did of my own. Here's an example. Uh, a component of the life that I value is family. Um, my intention for this component is I'm going to spend more time each week doing fun things together. Now that's just one intention. That's pretty broad. There's a lot of different things I could go there. Then I'm going to go deeper. The committed actions that I'm going to take are one hour, one-on-one -on -one with each child per week. Family dinner, four times per week. I'm going to maybe reclaim a holiday. Now that, that gets a little sketchy. I threw that one out there. That might be a little um, next level or advanced, um, but let's start with one hour, one hour with each child. So now that you've done these committed actions, you still have to go deeper, don't you? How are you going to carve that time out? What is that time going to look like? Um, I always use this example of donut Saturdays that I really wanted. My love language is quality time. And so when I don't get that quality time one on one with my kids, it just doesn't feel meaningful as meaningful to me. So I try to take uh, each kid out or a different kid out on a Saturday morning. Now, now we have to modify this because of our situation to just have donuts and we just chat and it's nothing. It's an hour. It's maybe even a little bit more. It's not some grandiose thing. These are 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour that you can do to really, really increase the meaning and, and express the values that you want to have in your life. Family dinner four times a week has been what, what are we're all eating at home, right? I mean, oh my goodness, I'm cooking every meal. There's so many dishes. One of the silver linings is that we're falling into a routine of eating together much more often because sports is not interrupting all these things. So one of the things I did in my valued living was I decided to add to my kids' chores that each one of them will come cook with me during, they'll, they'll have a week where they're cooking with me. And sometimes it's like, it's even just re reheating leftovers or, or chopping vegetables. And that's time that we're spending together. And sometimes it's not fun. Sometimes I'm like, no, no, don't stir like that. Oh, you know, but sometimes it's really amazing. It's, it's, it's just, I try to look at it from the relationship standpoint, but it's also a very practical thing. And who's cooking, you're gonna have to figure out who's cooking, what's cooking. So you you have work to do even on these committed actions. I'm just gonna talk about the holiday. Um, one of the silver linings that's really happened for me is again, we're drilling down on what's important. I just spent, um, our family celebrates Easter, and I just spent Easter with zero pressure on what my house, the cleanliness of my house, what I served for a meal and how we spent our day. And it was glorious. And I'm not saying that I am not wanting to get together with my family, but I'm saying crisis can often remind us that we are as a core unit of our family or of ourselves ha don't have to do all the things and, and holidays, if you can think about reclaiming one, maybe it's a place to start. What are the most stressful things about one of your favorite holidays and how can you modify those to spend more time? Um, we moved away a long time ago uh, and we lived in Kansas City and we were away from our family. And so we spent a, a few Christmases where it was just us. And I began to love waking up on Christmas morning with just my family and having a leisurely morning. And when we moved back and are near our extended family, we still continue that tradition. Now we have our morning together and sometimes we get up and then go off to someone's house, but we still have carved that out and kept that. So keep that in mind. All right. Are you still with me guys? Are you still with me here? Okay. So committed action exercise to review. You want to do the valued living questionnaire. You want to take some time to do this. You want to work through the steps of your most important values that you identified in that, in that values worksheet. And then you want to plan those out. These are your goals to reach your values. And I'm going to mention one other technique. Sometimes this resonates with people. Once you become good at this, 
you can take this next level with what we call the life purpose visualization. Now I put a picture of like a dream board up here because people love these dream boards. I'm not that organized to get a dream board, but I am visual person. So this might actually uh, speak to me. Maybe I'll have time to do that. Right. Um, but what, what's the life purpose visualization? Um, I think it's really helpful to sit down and imagine. And in this exercise, it's often important to just write it down. So you get all the details. So you want to sit down and take some time and write down what your perfect life is. Now in the biz, we call this the miracle question. Sometimes I'll ask clients, if you woke up tomorrow and everything was just the way you wanted it to be and was perfect, what does this world look like? A miracle has happened and all your problems are gone and you're living your best life. What does this look like? And we start to drill down on those details. Where are you living and working? Who are you with? Who are you living this thing called life with? What activities make up your day? Not what you want to do or what you wish you could do, but what are you doing in this best life? And what does a typical day look like from the time that you wake up till you go to sleep? What does it look like? And you want to write these down. You want to write this down and then you can take it next level and you want to record this scenario in your own voice using your phone your, or whatever. And you want to just listen to it regularly. It'll go into your subconscious. It's a, it's a reminder of, um, am I living my values? And it can really reinforce some of the things that you're doing here. So that's the other technique that I wanted to show you guys. Um, I think at this time, I, I want to just, I'm going to pull up on the screen my information. Uh, if you guys have any other questions in just a minute, you can write down any information here or screenshot it if you need to. In just a minute, I'm going to stop sharing the screen and I'm going to give you some time now to put any questions in the chat or comments or a shout out. I, I have to say, I'm used to giving in-person presentations and I love the interaction and I love to get to know people and it's, it's hard just looking at a camera. Um, so it's nice to have some comments and, and, and questions if we do. And I want to give you some encouragement. Um, we are all literally doing the best we can and it fear often makes us really, really judgmental um, of people buying non-essential items or um, people not social distancing or you're, we're, we're, we're sitting in our homes looking out like Gladys Kravitz from Bewitched, you know, we're like, oh, they're having somebody over at their house. I mean, fear and uncertainty does not bring out the best in us. So be gentle with yourself, please, and give yourself some grace and then give others an unlimited amount of grace. This is, we are going through this together as a community, as a nation, and obviously as a world. And um, we're also going through this as it, it, on a personal level and everyone does that differently. There are some people out there who are gonna be so much more impacted economically, um, emotionally, and physically than others. And nobody has a playbook for this. We're just doing the best we can. So if you're in doubt on what to do, you can always um, be kind and you can always love each other. And you can always say, I wanna help in certain ways. And if you have resources to help, I just wanna call attention to some of the amazing things that are going on in our community. Right now, um, Black Hills Area Community Foundation is uh, giving away ma matching donations for every dollar that you donate is matched to go toward food um, and disaster relief. So that could include housing later on, other things. Um, many of our businesses are giving back. If you have resources, it's another action step and another way that you can live your values by supporting those. Uh, Black Hills Area Community Foundation is their website's bhacf.org and you can click on the COVID-19 and look at that. If you are in need of resources, this is the time to reach out. Um, you can go to 211 Helpline website under their COVID relief. There lists a ton of resources for food, utilities, um, just support during this time. So reach out and uh, get help if you need it. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that we can look at the chat and please give me some grace. I, I, you think I would be a pro right now, but um, let's see. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to look at the, pull the chat up and see here what we've got. I'm going to kind of start at the top. 
Um, oh, Steph Ritberger from Career Learning Center says, hello. Hey, Steph, thanks for reaching out. I'm feeling a little lonely. I'm missing all my people in person. So thank you. Um, and I, I want to say that some of the silver linings that you guys are reporting, um, I've seen great generosity in terms of supporting people with no supports in place. I've seen genuine kindness and compassion. There's been offers of preparing materials for adult learners. Steph Ritberger works at the Career Learning Center. So these are folks who are getting their GED or certifications and many of them are high crisis and already really struggling. So she's feeling a lot of gratitude there. Um, Let's see, uh, another question is, how can you help others prioritize and gain clarity when they are in survival mode? Others may have many less resources and less support. So I'd like some interventions to assist them in finding that. That is a fantastic question. Um, I will say this, um, people are sometimes really not ready and do not have support and one of the things you can do is point them to those resources i mentioned go to 211 many area uh, agencies i know lutheran social services is one that's gotten a grant to provide counseling or teletherapy to people who might be struggling and might not be able to afford it many of us are taking on some free clients i know i am some other folks are too um, but i think it's just offering to do some of the legwork support just means saying it's going to be okay how can I help you do you need help with food do you need help with physical concrete resources and then doing some of the legwork for them maybe getting them the resources and sending them to them and then emotionally just encouraging them to say you're going to be okay telling them to do one thing today encourage them all you have to do is keep yourself safe right now. Keep your family as safe as you can. Compliment them and validate them on what they're going through. Um, I, I got a, a, chat, a comment here from Joseph Goodman. He says, I'm watching my with my graduating college seniors and from them, how do I find the good silver lining in the current job market situation? Oh, goodness sakes. Let me just tell you something. Um, part of what I do is work with, uh, do social work as well. Um, the job market situation can be, seem really scary for graduating seniors right now. My advice to you is to get creative, is to reach out to your networks, your friends, your parents of your friends, and say, what can you do? I, I feel so, um, I, I empathize with you, but here's some of the things that are not, are still going to be needed even throughout the summer. Um, people are going to need lawn care and they're going to need work in these restaurants, hopefully with drive through. I would say to you seniors out there, maybe grieve the loss of what you thought you were going to be doing like so many of our and maybe lower your expectations a little bit in the job market. Can I, I can do anything. I, you can work at Walmart. You can do fast food, even if that's not something you saw yourself doing. So I would say to yourself, be humble use this time as I'm learning from life and I'm gonna go out and get any job I can, be creative with your skill set. brainstorm what that is. We're gonna need things and, and it might be things that you haven't thought of. Can you sew and sell masks? Can you, um, can you deliver food uh, at a safe distance for Meals on Wheels? Can you do some of these things? Um, if you can't always work, can you volunteer? That would be my second thing. Can you shore up your finances? and volunteer and get some meaning out of this. So I hope that was helpful. And shout out to you guys. This is gonna be an amazing memory and a tough time for you, but you're gonna grow from this. Okay. Um, let's see, is it Misha? Misha says, how do you combat screen time with kids? To them, it is a value. They feel like it's a comfort for them, but I'm seeing that it's also hurting them when they see articles, false rumors. And oh, that is that is a great question. Um, here's, here's my approach to screen time. Um, I, I think screen time gets a really bad rap. Uh, technology is having a huge moment right now. We're Zooming, we're, we're doing this webinar, we're supporting each other because of screens. Now, 
depending on the age of your kiddos, I think the news is really scary for most kids. Um, I, my husband and I had to have a big talk about like, he would walk in the door and he'd get on the news and it would just be on. And my seven-year-old and my 10-year-old would be walking in and, and it's doom and gloom. And it's the worst part of what we're going through. And it does not highlight the other end of things. And so one, I think it's a great conversation with even kids as young as seven. Sometimes the news doesn't tell us everything. We need to go and find out on our own. Um, talk to them about the coronavirus. There are some amazing um, webinars. I think Kristen Bell did one for Nickelodeon, if you want to Google it, about talking to kids about the virus. It's awesome. I think we should be as honest as possible at an age-appropriate level. So first of all, you have that conversation with them while watching the video. Answer their questions. And, and I think we frame it to our kids. Some people get really sick. Some people don't die, so we're going to be safe, you know? And we frame it to our kids that way and we talk about their fears. But the news itself, I don't think is appropriate. I don't really think it's great for us. Mentally and emotionally, we have to decide what goes into our minds and our hearts and our even our mouths. I'm having a little trouble with that. But the news is scary. I would talk to your spouse. I would limit it. Um, if you can do some parental controls or if you can, if, the, if your kiddos are old enough to say, hey, I, I'm, I'm going to let you have screen time and I'm going to trust you, but we're not watching the news about this. And, and that being said, if you see something, come and talk to me about it. But I would try to limit it. And depending on the age of your kiddos, sometimes you can do it with parental controls and limit and block those websites. Um, and other times you can kind of have a chat with them about like, we're not going to watch this today. Or if you see something, come and talk to me. So I hope, I hope that was helpful. Um, okay. Any other, um, oops share screen. I, I, am I doing this wrong here? I, yeah, I hit the Q&A. <laughs> oh, give me grace, please, right? Um, okay, guys, I think I've answered everything here in the, in the chat. And so I want to just say thank you so much for joining me. If you guys think of anything or you want a more detailed explanation, please email me separately at um, Tracy, T-R-A-C-Y, at Polichek, P A L E C E K therapy.com. Okay. And great to see you guys. Take care out there. And I will see you soon. Take care.